Hello, Paul Hamler here. Welcome back to Paul Hamler's YouTube channel. Today uh, we're going to have a little video on showing how to make thumb screws. Uh, most of you are familiar with the antique tools, whether it be a plow plane or marking gauge, etc. Uh, this style thumb screw was used extensively in the older tools and it's not something that you can go to the hardware store and buy uh, they were also used on marking gauges the thing that's unique about this this style uh, thumb screw is it's got two little cavities or indentations on the side that makes a very uh, comfortable screw to work versus a knurled screw but it's a little more difficult to make so today we're going to go through how to make these from uh, round bar stock we're going to discuss two different ways of making them one is what I'm going to refer to as a freehand freestyle turning and then the other one I'll show you how to make a profile cutter and we'll rough one out about 90% finish with a profile cutter and then we'll finish it freehand there's also going to be two variations on these thumb screws. One is going to be where you make the top half of the thumb screw, turn it, shape it, profile it, and then attach a threaded screw to the bottom of it as a second op. The other will show you how if you want it all integral and all one piece, uh, how to uh, approach that method. So with that, let's take a look at the few uh, styles that we'll be working with. Okay, here's a overview of a few of the thumb screws that uh, I've made in the past. The uh, first one, top left, is an actual it's a casting uh, in sterling silver. The prototype was turned in in wood, box wood, and then a mold was made, and these were cast. After casting, uh, the threaded screw was inserted same thing on the next one over just a little smaller size not quite as not quite as fancy and it's also cast in in sterling uh, there's one that's uh, freehand turned and the next one to it in both of these uh, yeah both of these were uh, were turned from round stock and uh, <clears throat> one of the last operations you do is is tap it and part it off if you're going to install a, a threaded screw the t next to the last one here I think it's also yeah it's also been inserted with a threaded screw Whereas the one on the right is incomplete, it's just been profile turned and the stem has been turned down and threaded. So once this thumb screw is finished, it will be an integral one part uh, thumb screw. The, uh, the way I typically go about manufacturing these usually it's, it's always a larger quantity and I will take the stock and profile both ends in either freehand turning or uh, with a, a custom profile cutter and then I'll do the second ops either parting it off or turning it down so I can thread it if I want a one piece screw the uh, give you an idea of, of the process this guy has been turned in freehand turn the next step in the operation is to mill one half of it you can see where I've gone in and put the flat or actually it's not flat it's concave I've machined that uh, on the horizontal mill with the slitting cutter and we'll be demonstrating this and then what you do, uh, the, the, fix, the part is held in a, uh, 
a block, a square fixturing block, and you flip it over and mirror and do the other side. The, for f the filming process for today's uh, video, this is a thumb screw that I made. And uh, we will go through all the operations that were involved in machining this particular thumb screw in, in the videos. These are the uh, five turning tools, I'll call them scrapers, uh, that were used to manufacture the one in today's video. Uh, what we have on the left is just a square, uh, a diamond next to it, a large round and a smaller round, and the one on the end is just a piece of high speed steel that's been uh, sharpened like a, a smoothing cutter for, for your lathe. All of these cutters, with the exception of the one on the end, the one on the end was sharpened kind of like you do a lathe bit, a smoothing lathe bit cutter. The rest of them are all sharpened at a 45 degree angle. The rosewood set here, this is a portion of a case set that's got another 15 or 20 tools with it. These are the only four that I used in the turning operation for the thumb screw. The, uh, I think the, the two cutters are high speed steel. And in doing the freehand turning, a couple of things to point out. One, I, I did this turning not on a jeweler's lathe, but on a, a small uh, 10K South Bend lathe. Uh, and I'll show you the, the two fixtures that I use for a tool rest. The thing that's extremely important when you're doing freehand turning in brass or any other uh, light metal is you, your, tool has, your tool rest has to be extremely rigid. You can't have any room for spring or bounce. It has to be as solid and as rigid as you can get it, otherwise you'll get chatter. The other thing about freehand turning brass or, or metals a little different than wood turning where typically if you're doing a scraping type operation on wood um, you'll normally line your tool rest up so that the tool touches and contacts the stock at what I'm going to call the three o'clock position or straight on center line. In turning metal, uh, freehand turning metal, it varies a little bit in the fact that you want the tool height elevated or raise your tool rest so that the tool cutting surface contacts the metal at around 130 and what I mean by that is if you're looking down siding the end of the metal rather than coming in straight on at the three o'clock position you want to raise that cutter up somewhere between the one and the 130. There's a sweet spot in there when you find the right spot you have very little resistance and, and the shavings will almost just they'll fly off of there with very little effort required to push in unless you're trying to take an extremely uh, rigid cut. The second tool from the left is referred to as a square or a diamond. Uh, watchmakers use this for, for most all of their turnings on the jeweler's lathe. I would say that 95% of your profiling and freehand turning can be done with this one tool. So it's not a large investment in the number of tools that you need for the freehand turning operation. Okay, overview of a few other tools that I've used uh, in freehand turning. Most of these are, are smaller tools that's used on the jeweler's lathe. However, uh, you know, they do come in handy for larger turnings as well for, for a little detail work. The set on the left, I, I made this, I think the uh, handle is 3 8 brass and then the cutter that's installed is, as well as the four other to the right are interchangeable. They will, the, you can remove the uh, the cutter and re, you know exchange it with another cutter of a different profile. 
all of the cutters, the steel that's in the different cutters, are one eighth inch round high speed steel. You can use high speed steel or carbide. But the, the advantage of having a set like this, uh, once you get set up and get your tool rest set up, as you change tools, you don't have to constantly be tweaking or, or realigning the height of your, uh, your tool rest. Whereas if you're using uh, an array of other cutters, uh, each adjustment uh, for the tool to ride uh, will have to be tweaked up and adjusted. These are just a few. The, the black one in the center, I think is a commercially available. It's got a carbide cutter in it. These are sold uh, by the supplier of watchmaker tools. To the right are just uh, some spare gravers that can be sculpted and shaped and profiled uh, to make your, your custom tools. Now one thing, uh, when, you're, when you're cutting, when you're freehand turning, what I like to do, and you'll, you'll see it in the video, uh, I like to make a sketch of the, uh, the profile that I'm after and uh, I will lay this down on the bed of the lathe and you can orient it such that by looking straight down over the turning, the end of the stock that you're turning, and with the nod of the head and a, a, a closure of an eye, you can uh, pretty easily get the metal aligned to the drawing that's laying on the bed of the lathe and just use it as a, as a reference. I mean, this is the way I prefer to do it versus making a, a template and, you know, pushing the template up to the stock and checking it. This is more of a dynamic way and you can see it changing as it's happening by looking at the profile. Okay, <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, move the camera set up and get over to the lathe and uh, film a short uh, section of freehand turning the start of the, uh, the thumb screw that's shown in the middle of the picture here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now that we've seen a, an overview segment on freehand turning, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, profile using profile cutters. Uh, take a little skill set out of it. Uh, if you notice the uh, profile cutters I have displayed here, the one on the right is made out of a, a, a 50 thousandths hacksaw blade. Uh, it's it's rigid enough, it's thick enough, yet it's it's a lot easier to grind than the full size lathe bit uh, to its left. What I'll typically do when sharpening and, and grinding these cutters, I will make a prototype. It doesn't have to be out of metal. You can make it out of uh, wood or plastic, whatever. And I will turn a prototype to verify that this is the fit, uh, the profile that I'm looking for. Once I'm satisfied with the finished profile, I will saw it in half as, as the brass profile in front of the cutter is, you see it, it's, it's just slid in, uh, slid in half. And, and once I get this uh, guy cut in half, I will put layout now on my tool blank, whether it's high speed steel, uh, hacksaw blade, uh, or, or whatever stock that I'm making the cutter out of, the profile, and I will scratch in uh, the profile on the layout die and then I will go in using a uh, uh, like a cutoff wheel or an abrasive wheel I will go in and, uh, and grind the way up to the line of the profile and I'm holding the cutter as I'm grinding it slightly elevated so that I'm grinding in the rake or the back clearance on a, the cutter as I'm shaping and sculpting the profile. The third one over is a profile cutter that was used, uh, I think this is also 50 thousandths hacksaw blade, uh, was for turning knobs, uh, repetitive uh, turning knobs for a miniature plane. The, uh, the profile uh, can, can get pretty detailed by sizing and trimming your, your abrasive wheel to get into some really tight corners. An example of that is the last one here, uh, which is it was a top for a miniature plumb bob uh, and uh, it was pro you know profiled it in plastic and then I used uh, actually this one was done in brass and I cut it in half to to cut away and sculpt the uh, the cutter now these profile cutters are mounted in your uh, your tool holder on your metal lathe uh, whether you've got an Alaris or a turd or a tool post whatever and typically I will set them just a fraction below the center line and uh, if you can articulate these things I think there's an example in the in the video here but uh, for most part uh, I prefer to, to just leave out the extreme detail and just use it as a roughing you know to get 90 95 percent and then I can detail it uh, you know later I'll show you a little fixture for holding them so with that, uh, let's uh, let's go take a look at the uh, the video uh, of cutting uh, using the profile cutters.
Regardless of uh, how you got your finished profile for your thumb screw, the, uh, the next operation is the, uh, regardless of whether you're using the, going to have an inserted screw or a one piece, uh, you need to perform this next operation next before your last operation. Uh, and what we're doing here is, is mounting the, uh, the, the part in a, oh, I can't remember what they call these guys anyway, it's a square block. And what we'll do is put this in the horizontal mill and uh, profile the uh, sunken in cavity side uh, on, uh, on the turning. And after we do one side, uh, we'll flip it over 180 degrees and do the second half. And at that point, uh, we'll have the, uh, the thumb screw profile pretty much finished and we have to decide whether we're going to, which direction we're going to go uh, in proceeding to the falling operation. So at this point, let's go get set up on the horizontal mill and, uh, and watch uh, these, these recess areas being milled. What I'm using is uh, a slitting saw that is, uh, I think it's a little over one inch uh, diameter. The, the diameter is kind of a, a personal choice. Do you want that recess portion to be relatively flat? Do you want it aesthetically pleasing? Do you want it uh, countersunk quite a bit? Again, uh, it's, it's kind of a personal preference. What I did on this particular example, I used one of the marking gauges where the thumb screw was approximately the same size and put a radius gauge on it and that's how I determined the, the radius of my cutter, uh, of the profile cutter. Uh, not the profile, but the uh, slitting saw cutter. Now, the uh, <coughs> uh, other option that you have, in, ad <coughs> excuse me, in addition to using a slitting saw cutter, this operation could conceivably be done, uh, you know, on a pantograph, a uh, vertical mill. You could use a regular end mill with the proper chosen diameter. Uh, but if you don't have a horizontal mill and you don't have a, a access to one, uh, it's relatively easy to use a disc sander and, and just uh, sand away the bulk uh, of the taper on the two sides of the, uh, the thumb screw. And then using uh, a combination of uh, sanding discs, grinding wheels, etc. Uh, you can go in there and sculpt that thing. As a matter of fact, when I'm turning uh, uh, with the slitting saw, I tend to err on leaving it a little proud, uh, particularly if I'm going to cut a hole in the thumb screw or it gives me a little room to, to fine tune uh, the profile and polish it up. But uh, this it's a relatively fast operation using sanding tools and, and grinding wheels because you're not dealing with that much stock. So with that, let's take a look at uh, cutting these on the horizontal mill.
Now that we've uh, shaped the, uh, the recess on the two sides of the uh, thumb screw, we're ready to go back in the lathe and for this particular thumb screw that I'm making for the video, the one on the left, what we're going to do is just show a quick process of, uh, you know, drill, uh, drilling the, uh, sizing it, drilling it and tapping uh, <clears throat> the thumb screw for the, I think it's a 1032 uh, steel screw rod to go inside. You know, you can force it in there uh, into the threads or you can use Loctite or, or whatever, but typically there's not that much pressure on these guys and a good tight fit, maybe a little Loctite will keep these guys locked in. I have seen people actually drill a small hole and, and pin them, kind of like a shear pin, but I've never had any problems with them coming loose if you put them in there pretty snug. So we'll take a look at the uh, process of drilling and tapping. Now, just imagine instead of uh, at this stage of the operation, if I wanted this to be an integral uh, one-piece screw, what we would do is uh, with a parting tool, a small uh, tool going there, and from the bottom of the thumb screw outward, depending on the length that you want, for your threaded portion, you would turn that down, size it and turn it down, uh, and then then with an external die, cut those threads in uh, with the die. Uh, again, we're not gonna go into that detail, you know, uh, we're just gonna show the threaded operation, but uh, I think everybody understand what's involved for just turning, extending that shaft out there and threading it. The little tool shown to the right is a little small uh, scraping tool that I made out of ten thousandths uh, spring steel. It's sharpened and turned just like any other scraper, woodworking scraper, a card scraper or whatever. But I found uh, on your final turning before you remove your, your turning profile, and this is before you've gone to the horizontal mill, you can use this little scraping tool. It's very flexible and just a little light touch. It's surprising how quick that that little burr on that tool will polish and, and sculpt and level out any, any portions. And it's, it's much faster and much quicker and in my opinion gives you a lot brighter, smoother finish than, than sandpapers with a, a lot less mess. So with uh, that said, Let's go take a look at the, the video where we're going to uh, cut this thing off and, and drill it and tap it to receive a 10 30 second screw.
Okay, now that we've got the, the screw installed, uh, at this point, if you choose to put a hole in your thumb screw, which personally, uh, I've never been real fond of it. I mean, uh, the, the one on the right, the sterling one, I had to do because I was doing the exact reproduction of a period piece, and that's the way it was. But you see on the, the one that we've made today, uh, it's using a black magic marker. I've roughly drawn in the profile and the, uh, the hole opening that I want. Uh, pretty basic operation here. You got different choices. You can drill it and rough it out with a jeweler saw, or you can uh, mill it undersize uh, in the uh, uh, in the vertical mill. I've shown a, a threaded uh, holder. So at this point. Uh, you can tighten that thing down and, and put it in your mill while you're milling or drilling the, the hole in the thumb screw if that's if that's your choice we're not going to show that operation uh, on on this video however uh, if we have time uh, i want to show uh, show you something i stumbled across here oh, a few months ago uh, I know there's been a hundred thousand videos done on how to center and adjust the four jaw chuck, but this has proven to to me to be one of the most efficient, fastest operations. Is using this bell shaped center punch or center finder. Uh, you can go in. It works on round stock as well as. Uh, uh, square stock go in here and get in put you a pretty aggressive center punch and hole in the end of your uh, stock that you're trying to align in the four jaw chuck. Install a piece and uh, put you a live center or a dead center, doesn't matter, in your tail stock and bring it up to the end of the piece where you center punch the dimple. And uh, what I'll normally do is put magic marker, black magic marker, so all you see is just a recessed portion of the punch. And I found this to be a very uh, efficient operation to get your four jaw chuck pretty quick in, in the ballpark. In my lathe, I've got a dial indicator on the cross feed, so once I get the stock in there, uh, I've, I've got a dial indicator automatically set up so I can you know, fine tune it with, at that point. But uh, typically I found that if you center punch that guy and align your jaw so the dead center or the last center in the tail stock aligns to that dimple, uh, you're going to be within five or six thousandths. And I know that's a lot, but it, it's, it's fast and uh, it's quick. So we can add that to 10,001 on how to adjust a four jaw chuck. Uh, if I have time, we'll video this, but uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory in case we don't get to it. I want to take just a minute here to show you a couple of configurations uh, that I've used on uh, freehand turning. Uh, first one here has got the old traditional tool post, uh, cannon post holder, and instead of using the bar, I put an adjustable parallel in there that gave me a little, not much, but a little flexibility on adjusting the height. Uh, the next one, I don't know who manufactured this but it is a very robust, very well-made uh, boring bar holder. It uh, reminds me of the, the adjustment that a lot of the Revet lays had on it. Uh, you can turn that thing around and the, and the bar, the, the cutter will, will rotate 360 and as it's going around, it will change the, the height. So this is uh, what I used, actually I used use them both in the videos. I don't remember which was which, but this is by far the most uh, robust and the easiest to use. However, when you're freehand turning on a metal lathe, you're, you're always contending with the compound uh, or the carriage being in the way. So what I'm looking at doing uh, here is got this piece of hardware. Don't know where it came from, but uh, it holds a uh, you know, a, a tool post, uh, typical of what you'd find on a watchmaker's lathe. So what I'm gonna do is fit this guy to uh, my 10 inch lathe here and, and use this in the, in the future. But again, uh, you know, I can't stress when, you, when you're freehand turning on a, on a metal lathe here, that, uh, that tool rest 
and uh, where you're setting that tool has to be extremely rigid. Uh, the post on the left here turned out to be the, the less, least effective one, so this is my go-to right now. This guy, and hopefully in the future, uh, will make this guy work even better without having to fight the, uh, the uh, carriage being in the way. Okay guys, uh, as I say in the YouTube video world with that, we're going to call it a wrap. And uh, rather than having to find my JPEG files to put on the end of the video, I thought I'd do it dynamically. Have a nice day. Catch you later.